Hey, what's up, everybody? Today, I've got the Polk R500 tower speaker in for review. These came from me. Came from me? It's like I birthed them. These came from Polk directly. I actually reached out to them and asked if they would be willing to loan me a pair. And I got to be honest, I didn't even expect a reply because the last Polk speaker I did a review for was the, I think it was the R200. And I just didn't like that speaker. And I told you guys why. And sometimes when you do that, manufacturers are thinking, I'm not going to send this dude anything else because it's just not going to bode well for us. But in this case, the R500 speaker, which retails for about 1300 bucks a pair, it's pretty dang good. I do have a couple small nits to pick, but that's like everything. No speaker is ever perfect. And if I just glossed over these issues that I found, then I wouldn't be doing you all a, a service. You know, like some of these things may not matter to you, but I still need to mention them because they might matter to you. Overall neutrality of the speaker, though, is pretty dang good. I liked it. I didn't really have any significant issues in the mid-range. But when you got up to the higher frequency, it became kind of shouty, a little bit sibilant, but mostly just kind of like a shouty sound. And I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was. I knew it was in the lower treble region somewhere, but because it was kind of sibilant, but not fully sibilant, I was thinking, well, it must be below a little bit around maybe like six kilohertz or so. And when I look at the data, I see a bump around four to four to six kilohertz. So that explains it. Now that was with the speaker aimed directly at me. And by the way, I was listening to these speakers in my living room. Uh, size was about 18 by 14 feet with about nine foot ceilings. I actually powered these off of two separate amplifiers that I've got in for review right now, which is the Weem amp and then the NADC 3050. Now the Weem amp at four ohms is rated for about 120 watts. Fully loaded down, if you look at my review, you'll see that it's closer to probably about 90 watts. The NAD C3050 is rated for 100 watts at 4 ohm, but it can actually go above that and had no problem powering the speakers with that amp. Now, the Weem amp at 10 feet away was a different story. They just didn't get loud enough for me, but that is on the amp side of things, not really the speaker side of things, because the overall sensitivity of the speaker is actually close to 86 decibels at 2.83 volts, one meter. So I would say in a room, as long as you have a speaker, a speaker, an amplifier that is capable of delivering, eh, let's just say 100 watts, you know, typical output, then you're probably gonna be okay in a medium sized room. A smaller room, you could get away with a little bit less. For home theater purpose, these work well. They take well to EQ, in particular, the shouty area that I talked about previously, which was around four to six kilohertz. Ironically, the shoutiness was more noticeable when the speakers were aimed away from me. So what I'm providing you here is a quick graphic to explain what I mean when I say on axis and then off axis. Red is off axis, 30 degrees pointed straight out into the room, zero degrees and black is on axis pointing straight at the listener. Okay, so now you have an idea of what I'm talking about. When the speaker was pointed directly at me, there was enough air in the higher frequency to not make the shoutiness in the lower treble as apparent. But, and there's a side joke, air apparent. There's like a good pun. If I could do something with that, y'all come up with one. Uh, but on the flip side of things, towing the speaker out away from me and pointing it straight out into the room, which sometimes you would do for a bright speaker, did not work. The reason for that is actually really obvious when you look at the measurements, but without the measurements, it's it's less obvious. So the reason for that is the high frequency of this ring radiator tweeter narrows up super fast above like seven, six or seven kilohertz. So when you have the speaker aimed at you, you don't really notice so much of that narrowing, but when the speaker is aimed away from you, there's less air in the upper frequency. So that bump in the lower treble around four to six kilohertz comes out. It stands out as shouty or sibilant and it's making itself more apparent. And that's the issue that I have with the speaker. Now, using the Weem amp, which has a built-in equalization profile, I was able to go in and just use, I actually think I wound up using a high shell filter of about like maybe two dB at around four kilohertz, but you can also just get away with using a single band of parametric or even graphic equalization if you put it at the right frequency. I would say center frequency around five kilohertz, just dump that down like, two decibels with a Q of like maybe three or four. And you should be able to fix that issue very easily. Now let's talk about the bass. The bass on this speaker for five and a quarter inch midwoofers, 
it's adequate. It's kind of what I would expect. It doesn't get as low as I would want a tower speaker to get. But with these sized woofers, I think that's reasonable. As low as they get is reasonable. Now, how low is that? Well, listening to music and watching movies, I still definitely needed a subwoofer for certain effects, especially on movies. But if you're using these for a home theater, you're using a subwoofer anyway. So let's just talk about the music aspect then. Using these for all sorts of music from rap to pop to 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, aughts, even recent stuff, rap, whatever. I listen to all sorts of stuff. The thing that I continuously noticed was that a below about maybe 40 to 50 hertz, somewhere in that region, the bass just wasn't there. So the lower bass just didn't have enough heft, enough weight to give me that punchy output that I needed. Kick drum sounds were adequate. Upper harmonics of kick drums around 120 were also adequate, but there is also a strong resonance in the cabinet due to the height. And that actually brings down the mid bass area. We'll, we'll see this in the data in a little bit. And so I think that may take away a little bit from certain punchy effects or maybe certain vocals. Now it doesn't have the same kind of resonant droning. And when I say droning, what I mean is something like a boom and just kind of lingers and lights up the sound. It's actually the opposite where it just takes away from the sound. Again, we'll, we'll look at that in the data shortly. All the data that you're about to see is captured using my Clipple near field scanner. It's a state-of-the-art robotic device that allows me to capture anechoic data in a non-anechoic room that will then allow us to see the performance of the valid, of the valid, dang it, I messed that up, of the loudspeaker in on its own, basically. So you understand what the speaker itself is doing before you even put it into a room. It's great information to have because then you're able to say, okay, well, if there's this issue going on and I hear it, then is it the speaker or the room? And then you can correct as, as necessary or as desired. The impedance dips down to about 4.1 ohm, and you can see that I highlighted this cabinet resonance right here around 160, 170 hertz or so. Average sensitivity is about 86 decibels. Good linearity within about three decibels, even minus three to plus two decibels. It's well within that region. So overall, linearity is quite good. F3 at 51 hertz, F10 at 33 hertz. So the speaker does get low, but notice around 40 hertz or so, that's when it starts to fall off a little bit more rapidly. So you're gonna get down probably to 40 Hertz in your room without a whole lot of trouble, especially depending on how well you load this against the wall. Personally, I would advise you to bring this out from the wall at least two feet. I mean, normally three feet is the standard recommendation, but I understand that most people buying slim tower speakers probably don't have the space to bring a speaker out that far. If you can, I would advise you to bring it out at least two feet though. I would also recommend, as I said earlier, to aim it at you, don't aim it away from you. This is the CEA 2034 data set. Kind of the same thing you saw a minute ago on axis response, early reflection, sound power. Uh, early reflection directivity index is a good way to get an idea of how well can I equalize the speaker. And see this bump right around here? That's the area that shows up in the in-room response and what you hear as what I would consider shouty or bright. But down here, you can see that it's kind of flat and smooth. That means you can equalize that without having much issue. This is the estimated in-room response. It gives us a good idea of the tonality of the speaker in a room based off anechoic measurements. Now, obviously things are gonna change when you put it into a room, but this is a good foundation to start with. This blue line represents the trend of the speaker's tonality. And wherever you see a divergence from the trend is kind of my subjective notes, okay? so this four to six kilohertz region where I say it's shouty high frequency. I also noted that toe in toe out doesn't really resolve this issue and it actually can make it worse. Narrow directivity, lack of air when towed out. So at zero degrees pointed directly at you, that's okay. But when you tow the speaker away from you, like in this photo in red, then this high frequency drops off even more rapidly and it loses a lot of the air in the sound. Now, if you have a room that is very reflective, the narrow directivity of the speaker, the narrow beaming pattern of the speaker in the higher frequencies might be helpful. But on the flip side, it comes at a cost of expanse in the soundstage, a feeling of envelopment and sounds that are all over the place and stay well locked in their position, which gives us a good segue into the horizontal contour plot. Now, what you want is you want to be linear, either a flat line or a decreasing line, but you want it to be smooth and controlled. 
And for the most part, the speaker is pretty smooth and controlled, but you can see around three to five kilohertz, it kind of balloons out. That just means that the sound radiation horizontally is getting wider when you get to that lower treble region. And that's most likely the cause of what I heard in the room, it being shouty. Combined with around six kilohertz, you see how it just kind of narrows up right through there. For the high frequencies, you will really want the speaker aimed directly at you or as reasonably close to aim directly at you as possible. This is the vertical contour plot taken with the measurement at the tweeter axis. If your ear is above or below, maybe about 10 to 20 degrees, you know, kind of depending what angle we're talking about here, you're gonna be missing out on some key elements in that upper mid-range, lower treble region. And that, that, what is that? Like maybe two to four kilohertz or five kilohertz? There's a suck out vertically where the woofers below the tweeter aren't combining as well as they should, basically. That means that for you to hear the sounds that you want to hear, that you need to sit directly at that tweeter level. If you go above it or below it, then you're gonna get a suck out in that sound and it's gonna sound like there's a lack of attack or dynamicism, maybe even clarity and dialogue. This is distortion at 86 decibels at one meter. It looks good, but notice this is ramping up. Now I saw this with the other bookshelf counterparts. At 96 decibels at one meter, still looks pretty good. I mean, it looks reasonable for the size of speaker that it is. And now we have multi-tone distortion running 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Notice right through here, around one kilohertz, it ramps up quite a bit. I gotta be honest, I didn't hear that. I'm kind of surprised looking at the data that I didn't notice it, but who knows why I didn't notice it. I mean, it could have been anything for me trying to listen to other things or me being distracted by that four to five or four to six kilohertz region being a little bit too shouty. If you cross this over to a subwoofer at about 80 hertz, you can still see that that particular distortion area is still high. So the woofer's excursion don't really contribute to this. This is some other effect. Most likely, if I had to guess, probably a surround effect relative to the actual cone. And here we have the compression data that gives us an idea of, okay, what kind of dynamic range does the speaker have? The flat line represents 76 decibels and then 86, 96, 102 decibels, all at one meter are represented by these colors here. So from 76 to 86, about 10 decibels of dynamic range, looks pretty dang good to me. When you add 20 decibels of dynamic range, it actually still looks pretty good. But when you get to 26 decibels of dynamic range, going from 76 dB to 102 dB, we can see that the high frequency starts to lose some output and the mid bass, lower mid bass, and getting to that sub bass area starts to lose some output as well. If you're not listening to really high levels, then this purple line isn't really a big deal to you. And if you're using a subwoofer, then it's gonna knock out these issues as well. I'll say that this is about medium in terms of dynamic range performance. I've certainly seen much, much worse, but I've also seen better. The overall tonality of the speaker though, despite the couple things that I've mentioned, is surprisingly neutral. I kind of expected this speaker to sound bright like the R200 did, but it doesn't sound that way. And in some regards, I find that interesting because it doesn't seem to have the same voicing as the smaller bookshelf counterparts. Those are kind of my overall subjective impressions. Just to kind of summarize that, it's a really good speaker. The price at 1300 bucks, I think is probably reasonable for the performance. It looks like a nice speaker. It comes in three different colors, which you can see here in this walnut, black, and then this white color. So you've got a plethora of options to choose from if you'd like to do that to make it match your home style a little bit better. If the bass was adequate, you will need a subwoofer home theater. For lower bass music content, you're probably still gonna need a subwoofer. One band of equalization will fix the speaker right up, at least to my ears. But without that band of equalization, uh, I would have more trouble using this on the daily. Uh, it would just, that's, that edge of that four to six K, that lower treble region is just a little bit too, too much for me. It's a little bit too shouty and it's kind of distracting, but when you bring that down about two decibels, it just smooths everything right out, and then it's like, oh wow, it's a totally different speaker in that regard. I do recommend that if you can, you aim them toward you. If you have to aim them off axis, then you will definitely want that band of EQ, because you will notice that four to six K brightness showing up. And that does it for this review. Hopefully, you know, you've know you learned something, you've gotten to see the data, you have a better feel for what the speaker's gonna do, and if it's a good choice for you to use in your own personal living space. 
If you are interested in purchasing it, purchasing it, I'll have a Amazon and a Crutchfield affiliate link in the comment section below. If you don't mind, please purchase these speakers through that because it does help me. It doesn't change what I'm telling you here. I mean, I've already given you my honest assessment and you've got the data to go on to back that up as well. But if you want to buy these speakers, it helps me a lot if you're able to use those affiliate links. And I truly appreciate that. Um, yeah, I think that's going to be it for me for today. I will see you all in the next one. Take care. Peace.